Okay, well, this is um, a presentation about uh, identifying the common butterflies that you'll see in your garden, but also one or two of our specialities in North Wales, because that's where I've done my volunteer work the last 20 years. But for people who've um, joined from other parts of the country, very welcome. And I hope it'll help you uh, recognize some of the species that you'll see in your gardens and also give you a hint of where to find out more about your own special local species. So butterfly conservation, Mark has already mentioned, um, very useful to look at their website for lots of help. Um, this is a course which covers the, mainly covers the north of Wales and northern England, but that means it also covers most of the common species in all of the rest of the country. So it's easier to start with those, I find, if you are just starting trying to identify butterflies and um, you can find out about the rarities later. So um, these are some of the volunteer things I do. Um, Wildlife Trust Conservation Committee. I'm on the Welsh Government Pollinator Task Force, which is trying to look at um, how we can repair the massive loss of natural pollinators, which you've probably heard about in our local countryside. And um, I'm also the county recorder for butterflies in Flintshire in Denbyshire, which also apparently includes Wrexham and Conwy. Um, so if you have any queries about butterflies in those areas or um, help identifying any, you can contact me. That's my email address and my personal website and the local branch website is underneath and Mark will send you all um, an email with these contacts after the talk because um, you might find them useful. The Facebook page, as he mentioned, is really, really good too because people put up their own photos. Everybody has a camera now um, on their mobile phone and um, it's a, being a great way to help people identify problem butterflies. So let's start off with um, why I'm doing this. We need more records basically to find out where butterflies are still existing and where they are dying out so that we can try and save them from dying out anymore and perhaps even increase them. So there are some 55 breeding species of butterflies native to the British Isles today. Over half of these are now threatened and five species already became extinct in the 20th century. These are the ones that we don't have in North Wales, but you may have them in your local neck of the woods. Most of these are with the red cross on are quite rare, however. Um, that we've only got 34 species in North Wales and Cheshire. Um, and why has this decline happened? Well, I'm sure you know the story. It's all due to loss of habitat. And that's because of intensification of agriculture since the war, building development, and um, now climate change, of course. This is a picture of my own meadow. I'm lucky enough to have eight acres in North Wales, which hasn't been a working farm since before the war. So it's never been ploughed up and reseeded with Italian rye grass or other foreign species. And it's got the old wild flowers like buttercups and ragged robin in the damp patches. It hasn't been drained either. It's a natural damp meadow. Um, and these are very rare now. They're actually something like 98% have gone since the war. So I'm leaving two acres of mine to the Wildlife Trust in my will as um, a reserve, which I hope they will be able to continue because I've got um, a number of scarce butterflies, but I've also got things like breeding barn owls, tawny owls, kestrels, and other things which feed on the wildlife in these meadows. So they're, they're important, um, but I don't like blaming farmers for this change, this loss of 
meadows in our countryside. I was a farmer's daughter myself, and I know both sides of the argument. And after World War II, of course, the government encouraged farmers, well, in fact, during the war, to produce more food. And um, that led to this intensification of agriculture um, and building to rehouse people who had been bombed out, people moved out of the slum areas from the cities, generally improving people's lives. High nitrogen fertilizers were developed like Gromore, um, which makes the uh, dominant grasses and weeds proliferate, but um, that means the wildflowers can no longer uh, compete. And the importance of wildflowers is that a lot of them to butterflies are their larval food plant. You hear a lot about gardening for butterflies, about growing buddleia and things for the adults to feed on. But if you don't feed the caterpillars, you're not going to have any butterflies. And the same with moths and other insects, of course. They all have an egg and a larval stage first. And very often they have very, very specific plants they have to feed on. And this is what we've lost in our British countryside. They still exist in some areas and in um, large parts of Eastern Europe, which haven't been so intensively farmed so far. But with them joining the European Union, of course, they are racing to do what we have done in the last 200 years. And we're trying to say, you know, hang on, hang on, hang on, <laughs> don't do what we did, please. But um, it's difficult when people want to obviously improve their standard of living. So this is something that I'm interested in doing with the uh, Welsh Pollinator Task Force is how to reclaim bits of farmland so that we've got corridors for um, wildlife. And this slide shows a uh, typical sort of heavily farmed um, landscape with hedges taken out, no trees, um, rivers controlled, drained land and lots of monoculture crops so that the wildlife really has got nowhere to go. Um, use of pesticides and herbicides, of course, is another thing that's had a huge impact. Now, hedgerows, interestingly, as well as churchyards, are often the last refuge of the wildflowers that used to be in the fields. And this is a land just a lane just up from my house in Whitford in Flintshire. Um, and the, you can see in the border of the verge, there's so many wildflowers. There's red campion, greater celandine, bluebells, stitchwort. Later on, there'll be uh, hedge parsley and bird's foot trefoil. And some of these are important larval food plants for butterflies, and others are early nectar for wild bees. Um, and this is all very well. This is early May, this slide was taken, um, until the council mowers come along. Now, this has only been happening since the 1970s. Now, a lot of you may be too young to remember that, but <laughs> they never used to... I don't know, where, why did it start in the 70s? People now writing more often to the council saying, why aren't you tidying up our lanes and village than they are uh, writing saying, why are you cutting all our wildflowers down? And it's all very well when they mow in one metre from the edge of the road. If there's a, a nice big verge behind that, like this is further down the lane, and you can see the wildflowers are still managing to hang on in the wider bit. Um, but the lane on the left, how do I get the next bit, next slide to come in? There we are. This is what it looks like or used to look like at the end of May after the, the mowers had been through. They turn those um, tractor mowers on their side and go along the verge and scrape it all off. You can see there's even bare soil showing um, and that disturbs any nesting bees that might be a lot of our wild bees, most of them, in fact, nest in burrows in the ground, in old mouse holes sometimes. And um, this is the very time of year, early May, when they are establishing nests, when um, 
larvae are feeding up on the plants and this is the absolute wrong time to mow. However, we do seem to be getting somewhere because campaigning about this for 20 years with the RSPB and the wildlife trusts and lots of um, other conservation organizations trying to say verges are important. And um, at the top of this hill, there's a pub where my husband and I go for our birthday dinners sometimes because um, we don't have to drive and then we can just drink as much as we like and roll down the hill afterwards. And um, this uh, happens in, we have our birthdays in June and August. And the last few years when we've walked up this lane at that time of year, it hasn't been cut. Now, I don't know if this is because they know where I live and they know I've been saying this for a long time, but um, it's a good sign. However, you have to keep on at the council because you get a change of staff every so often, the leader of the council, and they come in and they see a letter from somebody saying, oh, I haven't you tied it up my village? Um, and they send the contractors out again. So um, it's always good to keep an eye on this and keep in touch, send to your um, transportation department is who you need to contact. Don't, cont uh, there's a, every council has a biodiversity officer now. They are supposed to, by law, um, be helping to increase the biodiversity in the county, but they are lower down the pecking order than the transportation department. So they are the ones who make the decisions about these sort of things. So that's how you have to um, get through to the right people. Um, on the Welsh Government Pollinator Task Force, I'm also trying to campaign to have these um, wildflower strips along the side of fields so that we can connect up land right across Wales through farmland, which is obviously that's the, the main people who own the farmland. Um, are the people that we want to be interested in helping pollinators. And since people have realized that wild bees are so important, it's actually helped us get this um, taken notice of. But we've got to put it into law somehow. We've got to get it subsidized. Um, and I'm not totally convinced that the Conservative government is going to put the money into doing that now that we've lost the funding we used to get from Europe to do that. But we shall see. We're um, trying to put pr procedures in place so that if we can get the money, then we can encourage this to happen. So some of the plants that grow along the verges um, and plants that you can grow in your garden are like bird's foot trefoil. This is a little pea-shaped flower, yellow flower. It's a legume, so it can grow in low nitrogen areas. Um, and it's one of the ones that grows from a very low growing point, so it doesn't mind being mown off. You often see it at the side of the road in June, even if the verges have been mowed, it flowers again, um, together with red clover. And these are also very important for wild bees, like bumblebees, that don't make honey. So they don't have a store of food back in their hive, or only a small store for their grubs. Um, and if they can't get protein in when we have these wet summers from their foraging every day, um, they simply die out. So we need a lot of flowers like this for the bees as well. One, I've got here one third of the food we eat depends on bumblebee pollination. You see different figures like this, but certainly uh, a lot of the foods we eat, all the fruits, um, the peas and beans, a lot of... Uh, crops are pollinated by wild bees of which there are some 250 species in Britain and um, also by moths and butterflies and other insects and um, that's why we need wild flowers it's not just a pretty thing it's actually about us surviving as well so let's get on to the identifying bit if you've got one of my ID chart, which I'm sorry you might not have had time to get by post. Um, this is like the ID chart that um, you can get from the Field Studies Council, but this is one I specially um, devised for North Wales and Northern England, which just has our species on it, which is a lot easier to learn.
than a lot of the rare species you'll find down south. Um, it's also got on the back a, um, all the diagnostics that I'm going to tell you about looking for in a minute on these different um, species. You can see all the notes on the back and also a, um, a flight table and that tells you when different species are flying as adults and that can help with identification as well. So on the chart we've got um, down this side we've got the Hesperidae, that's the skippers, we've got four of those in North Wales and most of England really. Um, the Nymphalidae are here, these are commonly called the Vanessids, we've got six species of those. Then we've got um, the fritillaries, which are very rare, but we're lucky to have a number of them in North Wales, but you won't see them in your garden. So don't worry about those if you've not got a reserve near you where they still live. Um, then we've got all the whites, the browns, and the more complicated family, the lichenidae, or the hair streaks and blues. So I'm gonna go through each of these. If you've got one of these charts, it's useful to have it open and look at the different sections of the families to get your head round which ones are in which family. But hopefully you can do that from these slides as we go through. Um, okay, that's just to tell you where you can get my chart from. It's my website, sevenwells.co.uk. So the Vanessids, this is the basic um, shape. Oh, what's happening there? Okay. This is the basic shape of the wings when they open. And that's a good identifier to get to know that basic shape. Um, and we've got Red Admiral, I'm sure you're familiar with. It's got nice red stripes. It's got white epaulettes, which I think of as having an admiral having those. Um, that didn't used to be a resident species, but it is now with global warming. We've got the peacock, which is our only species that has these big eye spots. So that's easy to see. If you see a butterfly, all of these are dark underneath, quite blackish, because they are the only ones which hibernate as adults. And they, so they look like when they've got the wings closed and they're asleep, they look like dead leaves. But when you see them flying, it's, it's quite easy to see if it's got big red or big spots like this, big circles on the wings. Um, and the small tortoiseshell used to be one of our commonest species, but um, in recent years it's had a decline. Um, coming back a bit now, that has these sort of tiger stripes on the leading edge of the wing. That's what I look out for when it's flying. You can quite clearly see those. You might think that is similar to the comma, but look for the edge of the wing, the shape of the wing. The comma is the only one that's got this really indented, scalloped edge all the way around. So that's quite distinctive. None of the others have this deep, these deep scallops. And then the painted lady. Now this is actually a migrant from the continent. It, again, it didn't used to be to overwinter in this country, but it may be doing so now in certain warmer areas. But usually it's a later appearing butterfly because it comes all the way up from North Africa, right across Europe. Um, it's one of the long distance flyers, the rare long distance flyers. You hear about the monarch in America that goes all the way down from Canada to Mexico and back. But um, most butterflies don't do that. But this painted lady is our species that does fly great long distances. The others are very localized. And that's why if their habitat disappears locally, so do the butterflies. And the habitats for Vanessids, luckily for us, um, include gardens. They have learned to adapt to our gardens and they happily come and um, partake of the nectar in a lot of the 
foreign plants we grow. Um, and also their caterpillars feed on stinging nettle. So as nettles follow mankind around because it needs a lot of nitrogen um, on the dung heaps, that's where they started <laughs> following man around in ancient times. Um, and they, because they feed on stinging nettle, then they, they tend to follow people around. But they're the only species that do feed on stinging nettle. And there are a lot of other plants which rarer species need. Um, so you find them in, in parks and grass, open grasslands as well, flowery grasslands. Now these are the skippers. You can find these top two are now becoming increasingly common um, and you can find them in gardens. They feed on grasses and um, they that is the larvae feed on grasses and the adults will come to various flowers in gardens. The funny thing about them is they look a bit like moths, but this top wing, um, they hold at a 45 degree, you know, like um, Dakota aeroplane kind of thing. Barry Kramer and the Dakotas, was it? Um, and so this is the large skipper. It's got, um, this one's got a sex brand. That means it's the male, um, detector for pheromones from the female but um, this has um, not got a sex brand this is a female but it's also not got mottles it's all orangey brown a small skipper slightly smaller but you might not see them together um, the large skipper comes out in the summer before the small skipper and this has more blotches on the wing they're sort of a midsummer butterfly. Um, these two at the bottom are quite rare all over Britain um, and they like brownfield sites. Something like 14% of our rare species now live on brownfield sites um, and this is because they've migrated to where there are still wild plants growing amongst different um, habitats that can give them warmth in our cold climate uh, like concrete and tarmac and these kind of things where they can warm up they're cold-blooded creatures they have to have the warmth of the sun to um, operate and so they need areas where they can um, bask um, and seems like a lot of um, brownfield sites are very good for this now. Um, so, but don't worry about these if you don't see them locally. Um, you have to, you might have to go to special places to see these now. As I say, a lot of them feed on grass, particular wild grasses, which are called coxfoot, purple moor grass, wood false broom. These are not the sort of grasses which farmers grow for grazing anymore or for hay or for silage. Um, these are the old grasses that used to be in the old meadows. So this is why they're important to preserve the meadows. The small skipper likes a lovely grass called Yorkshire fog. And um, if you, oh, well, I'll tell you about, in my book, this is my book about gardening for butterflies and it's got a whole chapter on larval food plants and it's got pictures of all these different grasses as well as um, the different kinds of caterpillars um, so all those things you can find out on my website. The grizzled skipper um, feeds on barren strawberry and tormentil and the best colony in the whole of North Wales used to be where the MOD have now plonked the new Berwyn Prison on Wrexham Industrial Estate. So I don't know if it exists anymore. It's supposed to be a protected species, but when the MOD want to do something, that all goes out the window. Um, they are supposed to be doing some mitigation measures, trying to preserve them. But the thing with trying to preserve these rare species, I mean, why they are rare species is because they're very pernickety. And if you just destroy their habitat and try and create a new one for them somewhere else, it doesn't always work. So um, we're trying to work with the local 
Council, the Wildlife Trust have got a special officer just for Wrexham Industrial Estate. It's one of the biggest industrial estates in the whole of Europe. And it's, so it's got lots of brownfield sites on it. And this is where some of these rare species do still hang out. And so we've actually got a special de dedicated member of staff um, for a brownfield site in Wrexham, which is um, quite unusual, I think, for most countries. This is what barren strawberry looks like. It looks very much like um, actual wild strawberry, um, but it's got truncated ends. Instead of having a pointed end to the leaf, it's got a truncated end of the leaf. And the flowers also look very much like wild strawberry flowers, but they've got a gap between the petals where you can see the sepals showing through. So otherwise they look very, very similar. Um, but this is actually not a strawberry, it's a potentilla. And this is also a potentilla. You can see this similar sort of flower structure. Um, and this is another larval food plant that the grizzled skipper can use. But that's about it. It cannot feed on anything else. If the plant's not there, a butterfly comes along. It um, can't lay its eggs on any plant it will feed on. It dies. Simple as that. Now then, the whites. Now, these are our commonest butterflies, not, not the clouded yellow and the brimstone, but these, these whites, four whites here. Um, the large white and the small white, which everybody knows eats our cabbages and brassicas. Um, the orange tip, which the um, male has orange tips on the wings. And the female doesn't, but it has this underwing with this mottled pattern here and the green veined white which is feeds on the same sorts of things as the orange tip and it has these dark veins on the underwing. Um, so the lesson in this is although they're very common they're quite difficult to tell the difference between unless you get a look at the underwing and you have to sometimes follow them around until they settle and then get down on your hands and knees or Get, there's a very useful camera on a stick actually I got one recently um, from the, one of these wildlife people look it's got a long stick for us oldie folks with a big mirror like dentist mirror and it'd be difficult getting that in your mouth but this is one you can put you see you can walk along and you can put it under the flower and you can see or under the caterpillar or under the leaves and you can get the underside of things very handy so some way or other you have to try and see the underwing and then with the large white and the small white they've just got a pale yellow underwing there with no markings on it the large white has a more black comes right along the tip and then right down the side of the top wing and the small white doesn't the small white's just got a small point of black there now you might think these spots here will tell you the difference. Well, they don't really. And because you don't tend to see these two together. Um, <laughs> again, um, this one is a bit smaller, but I, when you see it flying, the large white has a more, the larger butterflies have a more sort of floppy, slow sort of flight. Um, and you, if you look for this black mark coming further down the top wing, that will tell you if it's a large white or a small white. That's what I find the easy, easiest way anyway. Um, they all eat cabbage family, but these, the orange tip and the green vein white still eat the wild cabbages that the large white and the small white would have presumably eaten before man cultivated so many cabbage family. So there are wild um, cabbage family plants still, I'll show you in a minute. Um, these two are, these yellow butterflies are also in the white's family, um, but they are a bit different. This brimstone is very scarce in North Wales and some parts of the north of England because it's, or well, we think it's because the caterpillar has to eat buckthorn. It can only eat purging buckthorn or older buckthorn which is used as a hedging plant in the south of England and so quite common.
but it's not in the north for some reason. It's um, a very good drought resistant, easy to grow hedging plant. Um, so I have it on my website if you want to get hold of some. But um, this beautiful yellow butterfly with this lovely curved pointed wing, the brimstone is um, something we could quite easily help by just planting a buckthorn in a sunny spot in our gardens. The clouded yellow is not a resident species. This can't stand the winter in this country still, and it flies over from the continent in good hot summers, so you won't see it until August. Um, and it's a much more um, golden yellow than the brimstone, which is a more greeny yellow, and it, the clouded yellow has bigger spots on the underside. So that's fairly, it doesn't have the points either. Um, so that's fairly easy to tell the difference. Now, these are some of the wild cabbage family that um, the whites can feed on instead of eating our cabbages. So if you grow some of these around your garden, they will go to these rather than your cabbages, we hope. Um, this is called garlic mustard or jack by the hedge. Um, it has a nice little white flower when it's in flower and heart shaped leaves. It's got a very, very slight oniony taste. It's called garlic mustard, um, but it's not as nice. It's not as strong as the wild garlic, um, which is the onion family. This is Dame's Violet, which looks very much like Honesty. These are not really native species, but um, they are European natives and they are so widely grown now um, that you can find them in the countryside um, and very useful to grow in the garden. Now we're on to the browns families. Again, we've got two very common species here on the right, the meadow brown and the gatekeeper, and two very rare species over the whole of England, Wales and Scotland now, the wall brown and the grayling. Um, funnily enough, I don't think we've got anybody on from Northern Ireland, but funnily enough, the gatekeeper is also rare or absent altogether in, in Ireland. <laughs> which is weird and it's not far across the sea from us and it's our commonest species in the summer the gatekeeper but um it is can be difficult to tell between the meadow brown and the gatekeeper these both appear in late june <coughs> again with garbage climate change these are now a lot of species are um, moving earlier and earlier when they come out of um pupation stage but um, these, the meadow brown usually appears a few, a couple of weeks before the gatekeeper, at least where I am in North Wales. And the thing they usually tell you to look for is that the gatekeeper has these two white spots in the dark spot on the tip of the wing, whereas the meadow brown only has one white spot. That is actually quite difficult to see if it's moving. What I look for is on the gatekeeper, you see it's got orange on the lower wing. It's got dark brown border all the way around, all four wings with a bit of orange in the middle. And I find that's what you can look for when they're flying to definitely tell the difference. The um, meadow brown, this is a female, here's a male, a bit moth eaten, well, bird eaten. Um, it doesn't have any orange on it much at all. Um, the female does have some orange on the top wing, but um, the gatekeeper is the one with orange on the lower wing. So I find that the easiest thing to look for. These two, the grayling and the wall brown, seem to have migrated or survived most on coastal areas. They like brownfield sites again. They like sandy hotter areas and this is where they um, are found mostly around the coast now. Um, the grayling can look a bit like the wall brown but the wall brown has these definite circles, several circles on the underwing like this as well as this um, mottled colouring 
and the grayling does not. It has more of a fish scale appearance, which is perhaps why it's called the same as the grayling fish. Um, what other browns have we got? Again, we've got, um, well, three fairly common ones here. The only rare one here is the large heath. This has to feed on cotton grass. The caterpillar has to feed on cotton grass. So it's only found on marshy areas. In North Wales, we can find it on um, Wrexham, uh, what's it called? Wixall moss and on um, some marshy areas in Snowdonia. Uh, but uh, there's some up on the Denby Moors as well, but they're quite difficult to find. The small heath used to be uncommon, but it, I see it more and more in gardens and just down lanes now. It seems to be one that's um, managed to adapt to our um, local species of plants. Um, it's got a kind of greyish furry appearance and just one little dark spot at the top. When it opens its wings, it looks quite orangey and it's quite small. So that's how you know it's, it's different from other species that you normally see in the garden. This one, now you'll all be familiar with this, the speckled wood. This is one of the 20th century's um, great uh, successes for some reason. It's spread all over the country and um, it's got these, it's a more chocolatey brown. It's got these, uh, white spots on it which can form different patterns in different parts of the country but it's quite distinctive the speckled white spotting you can see through as it flies. Um, ringlet you think might be similar but it's not it's got um, quite distinctive outlined rings it's got black and white outlines around its rings and it's got um, several of them on the underside. When its wings are open, you don't see the spots at all. Whereas you do, as you can see this speckled woods wings are open, you can see the spots on the top. The ringlet when the wings are open is just plain brown. So that's how you tell the difference. Um, this is just to remind me to tell you to look on the uh, flight table on the ID chart because this is the flight table for North Wales, which is drawn up by Rob Whitehead, who was the recorder before me, uh, who died sadly in 2006. Um, and you see, the, you can find this information in any of the butterfly books, but they're all written by Southerners. <laughs> this is particular to our area in the north of England, but even now it needs redrawing because, again, with climate change, I've just been researching this for an article I've written for the local um, butterfly conservation branch newsletter, actually, um, just how much earlier, because we've got the records in the North Wales Record Centre um, from many, many years back, uh, we can see that the flight periods of the adults are, have moved two, three, even four weeks earlier. So um, we need to re-rejig this table. But it tells you things like, for example, in this part of the world, if you see a blue butterfly in April, it can only be a holly blue because the, the common blue, so-called, although it's no longer common, does not fly until June. Even here, it's got it actually flying in right in the beginning of May in some exceptional years but the, the common blue doesn't usually appear until the end of May now so there are things like that which can give you a clue to what the butterflies are knowing what time of year to expect to see them. Uh, now we're on to hair streaks these are all quite scarce really you wouldn't see these in gardens anyway um, this white letter hair streak is the rarest one we have in north of England um, and North Wales. It's got this white W, if you can see that on the lower wing, 
that's why it's called the white letter hair streak. All hair streaks have this outline with the little tail at the end. So if you look closely, you can see on this white letter hair streak, here's the little tail, which has not yet been bitten off by a bird. It's kind of like, it's a, I think it's a bit like a decoy. <laughs> it, it trembles when they land and I think it makes um, birds peck at it. I think it's a worm or something. So um, you can't really see it on this green hair streak or this purple hair streak. But um, have a look at the pictures in the books. Um, you'll see the, the, the perfect ones have still got their little tails on. There are other hair streaks in other parts of the country. Now, if you're down in Kent or um, somewhere like that, you may have, or South Wales even, you may have a brown hair streak, which feeds on the slow bush, which is becoming scarce in our farmland as well. Um, I have loads of it here and I'm trying to breed some brown hair streaks, but I'm not sure if I'm going to be successful. Um, but it, it is present in um, North Wales. One of the things with its conservation, the, North, the South Wales branch go around farmland in the winter looking for eggs, which are laid on the um, last year's growth and stay there right through the winter. So if the farmers come along and cut all the hedges, of course, you destroy the life cycle of that species. So we try to get people to cut in rotation. This is a magic word. Any of these things where like lawns, meadows, hedges, things have to be trimmed, things have to be cut back. Verges as well, of course, um, we accept that. But it's cutting them all at the same time, which does the damage. If we can just do it on rotation, like cut half of it one year and half of it the next year, then we are helping any species which are hibernating in the dead grasses from the previous year to proliferate and to continue until the next year. So this is an important um, thing to remember in any of these conservation practices. Purple hair streak, I know it looks very boring here, but it's a gorgeous thing when it opens its wings. It's a beautiful, vibrant, iridescent purple on the top um, and it lives on oak trees and it tends to stay up in the canopy um, and instead of getting sugar from nectar in flowers it gets it from the honeydew from aphids on the tree leaves so you also see them on sycamores although the caterpillars don't eat um, sycamore leaves or flowers the adults will get lots of honeydew from the aphids on sycamores. It's another thing to look for them. They are actually supposed to be, the recorders tell me they're of, um, in every kilometre square in North Wales, but you don't often see them because they stay up in the trees. The same with the white letter hair streak, it has to feed on elm. So since Dutch elm disease, it has become quite scarce, but it has managed to hang on. I'll show you some elm leaves in a minute and um, tell you why. The green hair streak is our perhaps more common species, but again, it feeds on bilberry in wet areas um, like Clochinog Forest in North Wales. Um, but it also can feed on bird's foot trefoil on open areas like Minas Marion near Comwy. Um, so you can find it in heathland habitats as well as marshland habitats. Some butterflies have adapted to quite different habitats and um, this is uh, a useful way for them to survive. So having a look at the habitats for hair streaks, just to try and help you identify the leaves of elm. Now, I don't know again if any of you are old enough to remember when all the elms started dying out in the 70s. It was a shocking time. My father had 50 acres in Somerset and he reckons he lost a thousand trees in the space of a year um, just in the hedge, hedges of 50 acres. Uh, they, they just all started dying. It was incredible. The place was a desert. Used to Castle Carey was five miles away, and growing up there as a child, 
I never knew Castle Kerry was in that direction because there were so many trees in between that you never saw the lights of the town. <laughs> but as the elm started to fall, you gradually you saw the lights of the town twinkling through and from five miles away, there were no trees in between. It was incredible. Anyway, it was very sad and we thought they'd all died and they wouldn't come back. But no, they are coming back. And I've got some at the end of my garden and the end of my fields here in North Wales. There's some down the lane. They're regenerating from the old roots. And this is what they look like. Elms have asymmetric leaves. I don't know if you can see on these ones. They're very small on the old English elm. Um, but they come, one side comes further down the stalk than the other. This easier to see on this witch elm, which has much bigger leaves. Um, again, not very good example. This one here, you see the end of the leaf on the leaf stalk on one side is further further down on this side than on that side. And um, they're also very rough and hairy, but they're much smaller on the old English elm, almost Procera. And it has this very corky bark as it gets older. Whereas the witch elm does not, the witch elm has smooth bark. And this is said to be the difference why the witch elm has survived from the Dutch elm disease plague. Um, and the, the old English elm didn't because the beetle that carries the fungus um, likes to burrow into this corky bark. But as I say, um, they're regenerated from the old roots. They can grow for 20 years or more uh, before they get very corky bark like this. And so the species is continuing and that must be where the 40 or so species of different insects that depend on this old British plant are still surviving. You may mistake um, elm for hazel when you're driving along in the countryside I know I'm terrible at, I know a, a famous botanist up here who talks about 60 mile an hour plants and 90 mile an hour plants. <laughs> Doesn't mean how fast the plant grows, it means how fast he's going when he can identify something from the window. <laughs> um, this, uh, when you're going at um, speed along the road, if you see this in the hedge or this in the hedge, you might think they're the same thing. This is hazel which is very common in our hedges, and it does not have the asymmetric pattern of the elm. You see it, it finishes at the same point on the leaf. So if you're going for a walk, you can have a closer look and see um, if you've got asymmetric leaves or not, and then you'll know if you've got elm, which is always useful to know. Okay, so now we're on to the blues. These are the prettiest ones, aren't they? You've got to say it. But actually, in, well, virtually any garden in the United Kingdom, I would say, certainly in North Wales, there are only two blues you will ever see, which are the common blue and the holly blue. And as I mentioned earlier, the holly blue comes out much earlier in the year um, because it's one that hibernates as an adult. And it comes out I believe quite early on, usually the earliest ones can be April actually, I have seen them at Easter, uh, on late Easter. Um, and they're called holly blue because the first generation feeds on the holly flowers. Sorry, it's not a one of the, um, the adult hibernators. It hibernates again as an egg, a white egg on the holly branch during the winter. Again, a good reason why you shouldn't cut all the hedges every year. And it hatches out when the weather gets a bit warmer in March, April, and um, feeds up on the holly flowers and um, pupates and then flies as an adult. And then that adult lays its eggs on wild ivy in the autumn. And that has to stay there through the winter as well. So it needs both plants to continue its life cycle. Um, it also has another problem where it gets parasitized by a wasp which injects its eggs into the body of the caterpillar 
while it's alive and these eggs eat it from the inside out and then it bursts out you know like in that film alien i always tell kids that when i go into school so they, Ooh. <laughs> um, but actually there are a lot of parasitic wasps that do this to all different kinds of larvae of different insects there's um there's always something to eat something else big bugs have little bugs upon their backs to eat them little bugs have littler bugs and so ad infinitum um so it's nothing to be too worried about it's all part of the cycle of life but this can um mean that the populations go whizzing up and down in different years you can have several years where there's a very depleted population of holly blues um and then as the parasite dies out because the host has died out then the host builds up its population again so this is a cycle which seems to be a natural thing that happens with a lot of butterflies but of course if the population gets too small then the species can die out altogether in that area so that's what what we're we're worried about so the holly blue how the male has nice big thick black band around the top which the common blue does not. Um, and it has uh, underside, which is different, which I'll show you on the next slide. So another one, you need to look at the underside to tell the difference. Well, the holly blue will usually be seen flying around high up because it's looking for um, holly trees and ivy high up in the branches. Whereas the common blue, will be looking for bird's foot trefoil along the ground. That's its food plant. So it'll tend to be around your feet. And if you grow bird's foot trefoil in your garden, you may be lucky enough to see this in your garden. These other, there are other blues which we have in North Wales. Um, this very special silver studded blue. And there's a special race that only lives on the Great Orm although it's been introduced to a couple of other places along the North Wales coast. Um, and the, male, the female has these blue patches on it, whereas the female of the common blue is always um, brown. You can see a bit of bluish there, but it is mostly brown all over. Um, the silver studded blue male on the Heathland race which is more widespread all around Great Britain. Um, the female is also brown. And there's a quite, well, scarce species called the small blue, which um, feeds on kidney vetch. And we think that's extinct in North Wales, but um, it uh, still exists in South Wales and it and then Somerset on the Mendips, um, limestone areas where kidney vetch grows, it's still in existence. It's quite a kind of brownish color on the top, but um, I'll show you the undersides now or in a minute. These are also the blue family, the brown Argos and the small copper, which don't have any blue on them on the top side. But when you look at the underside, this is where it gets a bit more complicated. These are the, really, in Britain, these are the only ones you'll have trouble between. If you go to Europe, blimey, I went to Greece once, sat down on a rock with a book in this little meadow. There are about 10 different species of blues. Oh, sorting them out. You, you really have to net them to look at the underside to, and work it out, which one's which. But we don't have that. We have so few species in Britain, we don't have that problem. So the silver, the, the, First of all, the main difference between the ones that you'll see in the garden, the common blue and the holly blue, the holly blue has no orange at all on the underside. The common blue has these lovely blue orange chevrons all around the edge. Now, so does the silver studded blue, but the silver studded blue is so called because it has this little silver stud in about the third cell up from the bottom. Of the underwing. Sometimes it has silver studs in some of the other cells as well, but not always does it have silver studs. That's not the real diagnostic. One of the diagnostics is that the 
This is a band of orange rather than these distinct chevrons that you see on the common blue. And another is that there are um, black dots all over the underside, whereas on the common blue, you can sort of join the dots and make a rough kind of circle without any black dots in the middle. So that's how to tell the difference. If we look at the brown Argos, again, this is very similar to the common blue female on the top. But on the underside, yes, it's got these orange chevrons, but it's also got a different pattern of black spots here. And it's got this little figure of eight next to the top edge on the underside that the common blue does not have. So that's how to tell that apart. The small blue, again, is similar to the holy, holy blue. It doesn't have any orange on it, um, but it has a different pattern, a more a row of little black dots rather than random dots that the holly blue has. So these are the things, the diagnostics to look for. And this is the sort of habitat that the um, Carnensis race, the special race of silver studded blue lives on the Great Orm. This is on the west shore of Great Orm. Looks gorgeous, doesn't it? And this blue sea on a sunny day. And here is rock rose growing in amongst the limestone outcrops. And that's what the silver studded blue on the Great Orm feeds on. The other kind of silver studded blue that lives all over the other parts of Heathland areas of Britain feeds on um, bird's foot trefoil. And the uh, blue family have a very strange relationship with ants. Um, you might have heard of this before, but this is a rock rose and wild rock rose that grows on the Great Orm that the caterpillar starts off feeding on. This is where the female lays her eggs and where the caterpillar will start to feed. And then when it gets to a certain stage, it will start to make a noise and put out a pheromone which attracts a particular species of ants, not just any old ant, it has to be a particular species of ant that lives there as well. And they are fooled by the pheromone, at least this is what we think, into thinking that it's one of their grubs that has got out of the ant hill and they drag it back down into the ant's nest without hurting it. And this is then also, this is when the caterpillar has gone into pupation and the ants are still looking after it and stopping anything hurting it and licking sugary substance off it. So the um, caterpillar is giving the ants some reward for looking after it. Then it pupates underground in the ant hill when the conditions are ready, it flies away. Um, the silver studded blue, the common blue, all do this. The other blues in other parts of Europe do this. They have not been observed, as far as I know so far, eating the ants' grubs. But the large blue, which became extinct in this country in the 1980s, there's a wonderful film actually made by some Polish students, um, of the large blue caterpillar living inside the ant hill, actually eating the ants' grubs. So you could, it, well, it, it's actually a parasite on the ants and the ants don't notice, the ants look after it. So there's a very strange relationship between blue butterflies and ants. Um, and, and, you know, you see these kind of things on David Attenborough programs and you think, wow, you know, how incredible and exotic. But these strange things are happening in our own backyard as well, if we only know where to look. So that's very particular that this butterfly needs particular plants to feed on and it needs a particular species of ant to look after it as well. So you can see why the stupid thing might die out if it hasn't got all these special relationships with it anymore because we've interfered with it so much. Now then, just to go on about um, recording a bit, you might have taken part before in the Big Butterfly Count. This is an annual event now, currently sponsored by b and I think it was sponsored by Marks and Spencer at one time and different um, corporate bodies that butterfly conservation has got on board to help us 
get the public interested in protecting butterflies. Um, and it has its own website, bigbutterflycount.org. And it happens the last weeks in July and the first week in August, usually. Um, and you can go to this butterfly website and print off this ID chart and take it out in your garden or in your local walk, in your park, uh, when you're allowed to go. It's a nice thing to do in lockdown and tick off which species or how many of each species you see in 15 minutes. That's all you have to do. Um, you have to choose a sunny day because butterflies need the sun to be flying. Um, and you can do it with children and it's um, a great, a nice thing to do. And then you can go back onto the website and submit your results. So it's a, a, a useful way of us getting results from all over the country. Something like 35,000 people have been taking part the last few years. Um, but when you get on to more serious recording, um, this is when we need you to be looking out for the rare species. And these are some of the fabulous rare species we've got in North Wales and South Wales. And in Cumbria, you've got marsh fritillary doing quite well, which is a, a rare species all over Europe now. This is our only completely um, protected species actually at the moment. Um, but these are beautiful butterflies are uh, very specialist needs and this is one that I've worked with called the pearl bordered fritillary on our only reserve butterfly conservation in North Wales um, where it still lives near Rithin. Um, this is the small pearl bordered fritillary but um, it's not nearly as rare as the pearl bordered and we have the silver wash fritillary, which is quite a long distance flyer and a solitary butterfly it lights woodland areas. And the dark green fritillary, which is perhaps more, you might actually get that in a garden if you live near an area where they, they live. They live down um, Newbra Warren on Anglesey. They live up on um, the mountain above Chandulis. Um You know, they are, they are around. Um, and they all have to feed on violets. Yes, wild violet flowers. The marsh fritillary doesn't. The marsh fritillary is a different thing altogether. Um, it's really called a fritillary because it's got a similar sort of checkerboard pattern, which comes from the Roman word fritillus, the Latin fritillus, for a dice or a checkerboard. So that's why they're all called fritillaries, but they're not necessarily closely related. And I'm going to show you the underside now, I think. Here we are. This is how you tell the difference between the pearl bordered and the small pearl bordered. There obviously is a size difference, but again, they fly at different times of year, so you, there, there is an overlap. You won't see them at the same time, so you won't be able to tell the difference in size. You have to look on the underside of the wing, and on the pearl border fritillary, you've just got one pearly cell in the middle. You've got pearls all along the border. That's where it gets its name, pearl bordered. But so has the small pearl bordered. But there's one pearly cell in the middle and the cell with the black dot is much smaller. On the small pearl bordered, you've got more pearly cells. These are actually all pearly cells around here. And you've got a larger black dot on the cell in the middle and that those are the diagnostic features. So this is another one which you really have to net them to be able to tell the difference. Um, but, you know, we don't expect normal uh, members of the public to do that. You don't want to damage them. This is something that somebody who's more experienced can do. Um, oh, sorry, um, I'm trying to get down to this. Silver wash fritillary is much more easy to, this is our biggest butterfly really. Um, and you can hear it coming <laughs> and it's got this lovely underside with this silver washed pattern, greenish and silvery, and it uh, lives in woodland areas. And the dark green fritillary 
has, as its name suggests, this dark green patch near the body on the underside. And although it does have pearly cells like the small pearl border and the pearl, pearl border, it, it, the pearly cells are more rounded and they are um, distributed all over the underwing, not just in these strict bands. So that's how to tell them. Just looking for the dark green patch, really, I find is the easiest bit on that one. And this is what they need. They all need to eat the dog violet. Some of them can feed on marsh violet, like the small pearl border, which has meant it's been able to migrate to wet areas. Um, and the books say that some of them can feed on hairy violet. I have not found any evidence of this, but this dog violet is very important to all of them. And the way to tell dog violet is that it has a typical violet flower, it has a pointed end to the leaf, and it has a pale spur. Now, if you look at any other violets you might have in the garden, you'll see that this spur at the back of the flower is actually a violet colour as well. The dog violet has a very pale, almost white spur. So that's a tell of difference. Also, dog violet has no scent, um, whereas your garden violets probably will be uh, scented ones. And we've done a lot of work on the reserve near Rithin called Earth Rocks. And you can find out more information about that on the website. At least I hope it's still there. I put up um, a lot of information about it years ago when I started the website, but it's been slimmed down, I notice recently. But anyway, if you want more information, do get in touch with me. We did a lot of work um, restoring this site, which had got scrubbed over so that the violets were not um, able to grow uh, and it now grows under the bracken. And this just shows you what a difference um, management work can, can have. This is when we bought the, um, the part of the limestone pavement at Earth Rocks, 2000, the year 2000. And we started work that winter um, clearing a scrub. And you can see this is the adjacent piece of land which is owned by a farmer who hasn't done the clearance work of scrub that we have done. Um, and immediately the numbers of pearl border fritillary jumped up um, and they've continued to rise. They've come down in years when it's been a, a wet, cold spring or summer, but it's now stays up around this nearly 100 individuals recorded every year in at the end of May in the peak flight season. Um, whereas down on um, the adjacent land, it stayed at extremely small numbers. These are just numbers of individuals. See, sometimes there have only been two or five individuals observed, <laughs> which is very near extinction. But as soon as we started clearing the scrub, whoop, up they went. So that is a fantastic um, demonstration of how volunteers can really help, this is all done by volunteers, um, can really help um, protect these species. I'm just going to talk about the necessity of recording, um, identifying them uh, is essential for making accurate records and it helps um, the in, assessing the impact of environmental practices um, research into climate change is very much tied into butterfly numbers because they're very sensitive to, to, to temperature um, and that indicates fortunes of other wildlife. So all these things go into the reports that Butterfly Conservation and the Wildlife Trusts um, write every and issue every few years which help government decide policies like the sort of the farming policy I was talking about before. This is a recording sheet, a very old copy, I'm afraid, but it's one that I put together some years ago, which just has the North Wales species in it. If you're in North Wales, this is much easier to use because it doesn't have the species that you'll find in the south of England. 
I've looked on the website last night and it seems to, this is called the casual recording sheet. Um, if you look for that on our North Wales website, it directs you to the standard national casual recording sheet, which includes all the rare species like uh, Adonis blue and Chalk Hill blue, which you'll only ever see down on the south coast of England. Um, so, you know, it's um, useful, I think, for beginners anyway, to have an edited um, recording sheet. So if you would like one, email me and I'll, I'll send you one. Um, casual recording you can do in your garden, which, as I say, is, is perfect in lockdown. Just on any sunny day when you see butterflies, just put the record on the, the recording sheet. You can do it on the phone now. There are phone apps which you can click, which also takes a photo and connects to the satellite, sends that satellite grid reference to your local record centre with the photograph. So much more accurate recording. Um, so you can find the link to that. Hopefully um, Mark will be able to send you this link for the North Wales recording app. If you go to the Butterfly Conservation website, they will, um, it's got the information about it, the local ones on there as well. If you want to do um, more specialized recording that helps us an awful lot, there are things called a timed count, which is doing um, once or four times a year, uh, May, June, July, and August cover all our species in Britain. Um, and just take a zigzag route across an area, the same place, same route, um, and in 30 minutes, note down which species you see. Or then even more um, specialized is the transect fixed route um, every every week, which is actually quite a commitment, especially in our rainy weather. <laughs> um, so get in touch with your local recorder or with Butterfly Conservation if you would like to be involved in this more um, advanced recording. Um, you need to be over 13 degrees centigrade, preferably above 17 degrees in order for these insects to be flying. Um, full sun or partly sun, no rain, little or no wind. Otherwise, you, you just, you so simply won't see them. And um, you can find out who your county recorder is, again, from the Butterfly Conservation website, which is butterfly-conservation.org. If you're in another part of Britain, and um, you could also find out your local branch website there. Uh, these are all um, about recording. Send your records in October to your local county recorder, or nowadays you can put them straight into your local record center. And join Butterfly Conservation to help us do these um, projects that help us protect these wonderful beautiful creatures and their habitats. And thank you very much. Any questions, please? Th thanks, Jan. Thank you very much indeed. It's, uh, that's just, that's, uh, you can't be my surprise there. Um, uh, uh, if, sorry, <laughs> I don't know how long, um, <laughs> how long have that's I taken? I didn't no, have no, a watch. That's, that's, that's fun to find. If you want to perhaps uh, unshare. Oh, your, I do this unshare. Stop, stop very top. And maybe if, if people stop, have share. any questions, there we are. they would like to. Um, What's the time? 11.52. By all means, if you wish, I mean, we've got, if you, there's a number of ways you can ask questions of Jan. Thanks, Jan. Thank you very much indeed. Um, um, I'm, I'm, that, that's, yeah, that's, that's answered a few questions for me. Things, things like the brown argos and the common blue are always tricky to find. To identify it in the field and things like that. Um, we then still very difficult, really, because of small butterflies, aren't they? Good photographs can help, can't they? Of course. Um, oh yeah, fact, yeah. That's the uh, great thing with everybody carrying a phone these days. That's got yeah. quite a good camera on it. Yeah, that's, it makes that's a right. huge yeah. difference to our ability to check records. Because as recorders, we have to um, 
verify records every year. And, um, you know, it's quite difficult to know uh, without a photograph. Um, there's some questions on here. There's some questions on the chat. I'm just going to trawl through them a little bit. If you, yeah. If you see, um, um, Someone's asked if there's dark well, green fritillary up on, above Candelas. There is. Yeah. I even knew a man who lived on that road that goes up from Flandulus, you know, goes up the mountain. And he used to get dark green fritillaries in his garden, which must have been wonderful. So yes, um, they, they can be found near a sort of a lot of limestone areas. For some reason, limestone has a lot of um, good flowers, good plants for butterflies. Oh. Hello, Paul's tell, asking yeah. me. Uh, yeah, I, I, get, um, I get dark green fritillaries on Bryn Erin in- um, Yes. The, yeah, um, they, they are more common, I think, than um, than a lot of the other fritillaries in sort and of small, around the area. And, and small pearl border ones as well. Yeah, yeah. I think those are our more common ones, small pearl bordered and dark green. Do you know above San Villas if it's the, the, the hill with the quarries on it or the hill where the castle is? Um, the... You mean the Gura Castle? Gura Castle. Is Gura. it that it's, hill? It's, or it's the same. Well, or is it on, about? It's not that side because that the the Gura Castle side is very shaded. It's north facing, and it's very forested and dark. So there aren't actually many butterflies that like that kind of habitat. But on the mountain that goes up, you know, the behind that you go up from Flanders. If you follow the road up past the quarries. You'll find yes. uh, silver studded blues in the quarries. They were transferred Fine. in in the wartime by a gentleman from um, the Great Orm, and um, so there are you know a number of places on the road up from Flanders, up the back of that mountain, that um, towards Slisvine then up the road towards Slisvine with the quarries I, on I it. I haven't actually been all the way up there myself. I every year I think I must go up there this season. I don't okay. Know. But yes, yeah, I know what you mean. It, there are quarries, there are small quarries up there where butterflies love to bask on the sunny rocks. And there are woods further up. Um, and um, yeah, it's quite good for butterflies in general. Okay, thank you. Nessie, Nessie, do you want to ask a question? Yeah, can I can I ask um, what your what your views are on butterfly nets? I've got grandchildren, and everything moves a bit too quickly to really talk about identifying things very easily. Um, yeah. And I, I wondered about butterfly nets, but I suspect it would be very easy to damage a butterfly. So, what yeah. are you, what are your thoughts on that? It, it's not recommended to use, you know, to catch butterflies in butterfly nets anymore. We don't sort of advise people to do that unless they're they've sort of been trained to do it in a way that doesn't damage the butterfly and to let them go again afterwards. Um, so I don't think it's a good idea to let children catch butterflies in nets, I'm afraid. Okay, um, so it's just patience, basically. <laughs> yeah, I think it's um, um, I'm following them round until they settle. Mm. Um, it, it's funnily enough, it's, if it's a warm day, but it's not bright sunshine, they're less active and that's when they will settle easier. If you're actually watching them in bright sunshine, they are very active. Um, so, you know, it's better to try and get photographs or to, to watch them settle if it's um, more overcast, um, if you actually see them flying. But yeah, it's, I know okay. it's difficult because when they move, it's difficult to see. But that's why I try to give people these simple diagnostics of things which I found out is, um, the easiest you know the one thing to look out for for each species that's so, really helpful thank you i hope you have um good luck with it and okay. when when we're back hopefully if we're ever back to being able to take walks out again and show people i usually take um walks to um go and look at butterflies in different places around north wales in the summer so um you know then then we can happily take children along and help them see yeah great thank you got a question here from, from well, it's an early question from vicky does do the, does the 55 that you mentioned include the migratory butterflies uh no that's the resident species ah, fair enough. okay that's good. yeah so that's why in some books you'll see it says we've got 60 species but that's counting things like 
the um, the coleus, what do we call it? The yellow one. <laughs> My memory's going. The clouded yellow, uh, and, you know, includes ones like that, which are which are visitors in the summer, sometimes from the continent, but they don't breed here. So that's why it's a bit, uh, you know, I, I mentioned things like the red admiral did not used to be classed as a resident species but now it seems to have been becoming that because of global warming um, and similarly we may even be saying that with the painted lady one day so yeah it, 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 the 55 is the resident species and um, but that can be changing with climate change Uh, there's a question here from Re Rebecca. I don't know whether Rebecca wants to ask this herself, but I, I can read it out. Um, uh, very useful, thank you. So looking forward to doing more in the garden to look after our butterflies and learn more. Two questions. One, what, what are your thoughts to butterfly kits that are sold? Hmm. Well, I think because they use common species, they usually seem to use painted ladies, but they seem to be um, stock bred. So you know, they're on butterfly farms where they breed them, especially to put into these kits for school. So I think that's fair enough because uh, children are, are learning about butterflies and getting to, you know, love them and be interested in them um, from um, stock which has been bred in captivity. So uh, as long as we're not taking butterflies out of the wild to do that sort of thing, I think it's, it's a useful educational tool. Rebecca also asked, asked the second, another question. Do we seem to have cocoons in our Wendy house? Do we just leave them? She's asking. Well, yes. Or if, if you want to watch them yeah. actually hatch, you could um, carefully detach them from where they're, they're stuck onto the wood and put them in a netting cage and um, watch them develop and hatch out. They will be doing that soon. Uh, Paul, Paul now asks, uh, are garden bird watch butterfly records shared into other recording systems? Well, this is a contentious subject amongst recorders. Um, a lot of county recorders don't feel that the data from, I shouldn't really tell you this, um, from... <laughs> <laughs> We're recording, don't forget. <laughs> uh, from the great uh, garden bird watch, uh, garden butterfly watch, are um, accurate enough to take as a useful data set. But my argument is with 35,000 people sending in records, you can still do statistical analyses on those, which gives you some patterns, which give you some, you know, you know it's a, such a big data set. That I think it is useful. So these um, records are sent to us at the end of each year as recorders from butterfly conservation, but some recorders don't actually pay a lot of attention to them. Um, so, you know, but I think it's, it's a very useful thing to get uh, the pulse of butterflies in the country where species are moving with climate change and that sort of thing. For example, something like um, the marbled white never used to be seen in North Wales or north of about mid Wales and north north of Birmingham. Um, so, um, but now it's beginning to move north and people will see that through the, the great big butterfly count from the general public, I think. So that will be interesting. Uh, I, I'm not sure. I'm just checking whether anybody uh, wants to ask a question. Uh, nobody, nobody with a hand up. Um, if you've not, if I've missed your hand up, I apologise. I can't see any anywhere there. There's some good, good, good advice coming up here from Polly. Go out with your local butterfly conservation or wildlife trust. They love to teach children, which is so true, isn't it? Um, yes, but we can't do it at the moment. Oh, no, I know. That's right. <laughs> uh, <sure enough. laughs> uh, Bruce, Bruce Hurst is is waving to me. Is he waving? Ah, right. I can't. Yeah, we've lost Bruce. But Bruce, do you want to ask a question, Bruce? Go ahead then. Enjoy. Uh, uh, 
I find it quicker to talk than write, so I hope you don't mind. No, that's fine. Yeah, that's good, that's good. Very good. Very good. But, uh, something, I mean, something I'm, uh, Mark always knows, because uh, <laughs> I'm the county motor for PC49 now. And uh, so I'm always, uh, when you say, for example, um, you see, a, say, um, a butterfly in your garden, Red Admiral flies over. Um, when it comes to recording, um, how and then perhaps a couple of days later, you see a red admiral butterfly in your garden. How do you uh, sort of know? Because you don't really know; it's not the same one. And you, well, the software is supposed to take this into account, kind of thing. The software the, the is supposed to take it into account. Um, that's what we're always told with transects. If you're walking a transect and you see the same butterfly fly past you twice. Don't worry if you're not sure if it's the same individual or not, because um, you, you just note it each one, you, each time you see one, you note it down. And then the, um, the software that's used to analyze the transect data um, copes with, with that kind of repeatability. But I mean, we get so few numbers now that um, I just, any record is a record of as far as I'm concerned, it's useful. So, so if I, I say, I, I, uh, if I see, because if, if I see one a couple of days later from being in the garden, I, I, it's still a record then. John. Yes, I, I would record it again, unless it's got a particular mark on it that tells you that it's the same individual. You know, if it's been eaten by a bird in a particular place so that it's got a nick out of it, you know, then like the, they, they tell different um, dolphins, don't they, from the nicks on their dorsal fins. <laughs> I suppose you could, you could tell that with Lepidoptera, but that's not very common. Okay, thank you. Tim, do you want to ask Tim? a question? Tim, yeah. Tim. Uh, um, hello, Jan. Hello, how are um, you? Yeah, good, how are you? Um, thank you for the talk. Can I, I, I just follow on from your comments about the um, verge cutting, please, on the on the hedgerows? Mm. Um, I, I alerted the council last year, uh, and, the, and the, the Westminster MP and the uh, Cardiff MP about the early cutting of the verges around our field, uh, around our, our uh, minor roads at Rancheros, with some pretty destructive uh, destructive results before the end of June. And yes, I, I remember what yes, happened about that. I, I wasn't really very encouraged by the response I received. So I wrote to Tudor Jones, our county councillor, and he was quite helpful. And he suggested I write uh, a petition, which I should sign, get asked as many people as I, as I can to sign, and send it for consideration by an, an arcane part of, of county, local county legislation, where it would be heard by the by the agenda for public question time at the end of a council meeting, Gosh. which I did. Mm -hmm. And I have submitted it, and I've just heard today from him that he has, that they're going to hear it uh, at, uh, at the petition to the, this petition to the full council committee. Now I wrote to the, the, uh, uh, the, the officer for responsible for democratic services called Mr. Robert Robbins, and he's the man who deals with these issues. And so I'm hope, hope, hoping that perhaps by alerting them to the, to the issue, and I also mentioned the fact that Denby Council have a very enlightened policy towards verge cutting, which could be quite easily considered and maybe even adopted by Flintshire, that it might have some, uh, some effect. So if anybody is in any way interested in, in following up or actually uh, 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 sending similar comments to Flintshire, it might well help in promoting this issue maybe with the result of um, a, a slightly less destructive approach to the yes. cut in the future. No, well, well done. I think that's fantastic. But I, I think you'll find that sometimes if it depends, all depends who you're talking to in the council. Mm. And um, if they're not sympathetic to the idea, then it's a brick wall. Um, um, so that's why I, I, I hope we can get it actually legislated mm. for in, you know, through the, the pollinator task force, but mm. it's all very slow doing getting these things done. But yeah, well done for keeping up. Could I, could I, could I ask one other thing, Jan? Um, when you were talking about the 
uh, the nursing effect on, on ants on blue butterflies mm. create the species which are uh, which are uh, uh, which are in, uh, affected by the the care of the of the ants. Uh, I didn't didn't quite I can't remember what you said. I know the large blue is is one of the one of the, uh, the species. Which other blues are also uh, nursed by? Well, ants? we think that probably all blues have mm. a relationship mm. with ants. When you if you go to um, European countries where they have m multiple different blue species, like Greece. Um, you can see how they probably all evolved, I think anyway, from the same ancestor species. They're all very, very similar to the common blue, just different numbers of black spots on the underside and various things like that. Um, and they all seem to have this um, uh, symbiotic or maybe it's parasitic um, relationship with particular species of ants. Sometimes it's different species of ants in different places um but uh you know it seems to be something particular to blue butterflies so i think it's probably all evolved from the similar ancestor that did this first of all i just wondered if some of the some of these species which still survive in dis in unimproved past and in, in, in um improved pastures uh can still um, reproduce despite the fact that there may well be very few yeah, ants i don't know like ones. like the common blue and the holly blue yes Holly blue doesn't do this, obviously, because it ha lays its eggs on on um, tree species. So oh, that's very interesting. Yes, I'll have to have a look at that. Yes, I'm not sure. You, I, I, but I think I had heard that the common blue uses ant hills, but um, goodness knows where it would find ant hills these days. That's I wondered. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We've got quite a few. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, thanks, thanks, Tim. That's fantastic. Sure. That's, that's, that's a good, yeah, good for research. Uh, mm -hmm. Joyce, Joyce has got a question. Joyce, oh, unmute yourself, Joyce. There we are. Okay. Hello. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hello. Hello. Thank you. Thank you for your talk. Uh, we have a lot of wild garlic in our garden in fact it's trying to take over the garden oh, uh, is it any yeah. is it any use for butterflies that's the the sort of the the oniony garlic yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah. 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 yeah um i think they can use the flowers for um nectar but otherwise it's not that particularly important for butterflies i don't think okay, so okay. It, it is very invasive i know I, yes i have seen it in um various churchyards where it's completely taken over so mm. it you know yes it, it's very fashionable to eat it now but um <laughs> it's uh, we've got an excess yes <laughs> i think you can you can um get rid of some of it for your sanity's sake if <laughs> without yeah. harming the wildlife too much yes yes <laughs> thank you <laughs> thank you thanks joe I own it. <laughs> um, good, uh, okay. No one else has got that hand up. No, I've got a, no. I've got, I've got a, no, no more. No. Somebody's yes. saying, Vicky Ellis says, please can you emphasize how important yes, yes. recording yeah, yeah. with your local biological record center is? Um, yes, well, I did mention that um, you can, if you use the phone app now, it goes directly into your, well, it goes to iRecord and then it goes to your local record center. Mm. So I didn't talk about Covnod, our North Wales mm. record centre, too much because I know we've got people listening who are from other parts of um, Britain. Um, but uh, yeah, every 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 region of Britain has its own local record centre, and this is important. I've been trying to explain this to butterfly conservation, who keep telling me they want us all to use iRecord, and I keep telling them that we are a devolved nation as is Scotland and Northern Ireland, of course, and that when the councils look at any development proposals, to whether to grant um, permission or not, they go to the local record centre to look at if there's any evidence of rare species on the site. So this is why it is so important to use our local record centres and not just the central British one. So, um, yes, that is a, a good point. You can find, you know, you can search any of these things online now. Just Google local record centre for Suffolk and you'll get your answer. 
if you, wherever you happen to live. <laughs> that's true. There's one everywhere, isn't there? Thanks, Jan. Thank you. Yeah. There, there aren't any. That's not good. I'm glad you pointed that out there. There's not. There's, oh, there's one more message. Oh, and Jan, Bruce agreed. Bruce agrees. Uh, that's fantastic, Bruce. I'm, I'm going to wind it up now, if that's all right, Jan. Uh, no more questions, I don't think. Yeah, um, um, I welcome uh, any emails from people who um, want more information about anything. I'm sorry if I went on too long. No, no, I didn't have that. a clock with me. <laughs> so I just kind of... And, and it's funny, it's weird giving Zoom talks. It's not the same as... Because you're not getting any feedback from people. You're not getting even a smile on a face or... Um, or people dropping off you can't see you know we tell people to to, to to turn their videos off in north wales because our broadband isn't so um wonderful you, you don't get the same feedback you do in a, in a church hall with people no. dropping off in the front row you think oh dear perhaps i've gone on too long i better hurry up <laughs> i'm just gonna i'm just gonna read, read in one comment from susan and horace from anglesey this has been a great prime over this year's butterfly watching thank you so much jan i'm gonna reiterate that uh, thank you, thank me as well for putting it on so, so they could join today. But that it, it has been a great primer, and it's been more than just a primer, I think, in a sense. Uh, we've learned a lot today, and uh, and and I'll, and I'll, I'll if, if I'll put on, I'll send an email out to everyone that's joined today, on and people who haven't managed to join. Yeah, so we should um, say thank you to Mark, who's done a lot of these yeah. these Zoom sessions for us all, and it's been absolutely marvelous in lockdown. And I do hope they continue but, afterwards. But he needs other people to help him because. Um, <laughs> He's spending all his time doing this. <laughs> <laughs> I, do, I do seem to spend a lot of time looking at this screen in front of me at the moment. Oh, yeah. uh, not just like you, I don't, I don't actually kind of manage to kind of interact with people other than just individually, individual little, little, little pockets of video. It's, it's, it's still unusual, but I really thank everybody for coming. It's been fantastic, really, that people have, all the people have come uh -huh. today and are coming to it. And please book for other talks. So we've got a couple more coming up. We may take a break after that. Um, hopefully we'll be able to get out and about into the, the wide world um, to see these butterflies and see lots of other creatures as well. So we're looking forward to that. Okay. Uh, but I will send out a follow-up email. Uh, John, you can, you can send me anything you'd like to put in that email uh, and I'll, I'll put on the a link to, to, to purchase your, your charts. Oh yeah, if they, if they want the charts. Um, yeah, I'll put all that stuff on and uh, people can have it all in one place. And from my website, it. yeah. yeah. From your website as well, okay. But if, but if, if, if we're okay with finishing that, if people want to really kind of show their appreciation, they can, if, if anyone that's, there's 44 people still here, 44 people, computers still here. If you want to all unmute yourselves, <laughs> uh, if you wish to, all unmute yourself, show yourself on video if you wish to, and give Dan a round of applause. That would be fantastic. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's a long time. Uh, <laughs> you see, you well, see you all again soon. See you all again soon. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.